everybody for the afternoon session. I'm Paula Capellano, I'm at MIT and also ICON. It will be your chair. So the first talk will be by Jorge Muller. He's going to tell us how to search for dark matter and dark energy uh, with uh, AMO2. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot to the organizers. Wonderful workshop, even though I've missed the first day because of teaching. Um, but even on that second day, I already learned a lot. And a lot of what I'm going to tell you has a lot of overlap with what you already hear. It. Um, the key technology in this talk will be atom interferometry, about which you probably heard yesterday. Um, we are looking for dark matter models and dark energy models along the line of very light particles rather than very heavy. Um, so let's go through it. There will be a brief introduction, and then I have two main topics. One is looking for a dark matter through measuring the fine structure constant. This title is a little bit putting the cart before the horse. I would usually present it as here's a project to measure the fine structure constant, and one of the reasons to do so is to compare the result with Jerry's wonderful G-2 experiments. And that comparison is a broad test of the standard model of particle physics. In particular, it would be sensitive to particles we might have overlooked so far, among which could be dark matter candidates. Since the main topic of this workshop is the dark sector, I put the dark sector in front here. The second main topic is looking for candidate theories of dark energy through screened boson-mediated forces. And in this case, that's not putting the cart before the horse. There's a theory that dark energy, if it exists, or no, it's, um, it's not really controversial whether it exists, but if it has anything to do with new physics, then most likely this new physics is going to contain bosons. Because of Lorentz symmetry, you expect something isotropic, and a fermionic theory would have a preferred direction from the spin. But these bosons are, in general, going to mediate forces. So where are they? And we've been looking for them. And then there'll be an outlook. So dark matter. Here is the bullet cluster. Chandra X-ray observations are a very good measure of the density of normal matter, shown in pink. And gravitational lensing is a very good measure of the mass density at all, including normal matter and dark matter. And you see, the main contributions to the mass are not even at the same place as the luminous matter. Okay, so this is one of the striking pieces of evidence. The project I'm going to present you has been developed over now nearly 10 years, starting with me being a postdoc in Steve Chu's group at Stanford. Xiao Yu Lan built up the experiment at Berkeley, an atomic fountain, as a ramsey Bourdais atom interferometer. Right now, Richard Parker, who was previously the grad student of Lu at Argonne, is a wonderful postdoc who's transformed the project into a very systematic one that's making rapid progress should also mention Brian Estee, the most experienced grad student on the project, who has just a dazzling amount of technical knowledge in his head. Anyway, so the first evidence for dark matter, as we all know, comes from a galactic rotation curves. This is the speed of a star orbiting the galaxy as a function of distance from the center. And in Newtonian gravity, no dark matter, you would expect the speed to go down simply because you're further away from the mass, so there's less force to make up for the centrifugal force on your circular orbit, and we know the galaxy is not flying apart. That gives you this one, and the measured curve is in striking disagreement. That's the first piece of evidence. Another piece of evidence already mentioned is gravitational lensing. And from gravitational lensing and X-ray observations, this reconstructed false color image of the bullet cluster is a striking illustration. Now, this is a slide that I've stolen from Sajid Rajendran, who is a colleague at Berkeley. He points out that the classical dark matter candidate are weakly interacting massive particles around 100 GeV. There are historical reasons why this is the most studied candidate, and there's also scientific reasons called the dark matter, the wimp miracle that was already mentioned. But after decades of research, 
research that remains important but has reached very high levels of sensitivity to the point where maybe strong increases of sensitivity are getting harder and harder, has not detected uncontroverted evidence for dark matter. Okay, so let's see, maybe we should be looking at other mass ranges. And the surprising fact is this entire range from 10 to minus 55 grams up to the size of roughly the moon is allowed for dark matter and compatible with the astrophysical evidence. If it would clump to even larger objects, we would see their gravitational influence in the solar system every once in a while. If the particles would be even lighter than that, they would tunnel out of the galaxy, which is not consistent with observations. And these are the only really hard limit from astrophysics. In between, there's a vast range, some of which were studied, some of which not at all studied. Ultra heavy, for example, could give rise to anomalous signals in LIGO. If a dark asteroid passes by, it would apply a tidal force to the LIGO mirrors, which could be detected. Um, we wrote a paper with Rana Adhikari and Valera Frolov, Maxim Pospelov. Um, these are LIGO people on this possibility. But um, in this talk, I'm going to comment on the ultra light sector that other people have talked about already. The difference between a WIMP detector and an ultralight boson detector is, well, most um, straightforward, the mass scale. Let's compare it to an X-ray photon, which can be detected by a Geiger counter because it has enough energy in and of itself to trigger an avalanche and your Geiger counter goes click. I have here a detector for radio photons but it's not able to pick up individual radio photons. It is very sensitive all the same, given that one watt of radiated power in the microwave domain is many, 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 many photons. And those many photons collectively pull on the electrons in the antenna inside the cell phone. So, and this is the same for dark matter. WIMPs I would detect individually, but stuff on a scale of one EV or lower, I would detect through their collective force that they apply on normal matter objects. Atom interferometry is a sensitive force detector, so there you go. So let's see. This is a slide I like and that I can brag shamelessly about because I haven't contributed to any of the data points on this. This is the precision or accuracy, I should be accurate about this term, um, of atomic clocks as function of time from the first cesium atomic clock by Essen and Perry in 56 to probably, this is slightly outdated, the second most advanced um, lattice clocks that are being built in Boulder, Colorado these days and I bet that Shimon has talked about them yesterday. If you draw a line from this last point to this first point, you find a progress of about a factor of two every other year. This is extremely rapid progress that not every field of science can claim to have. In the case of atomic physics, it is probably because these experiments take maybe five people each and not 50 and not 500. So many approaches can be studied at the same time and then after a few years, the best approach is adopted by everyone. Which means if your dark matter theory predicts a very small signal that influences the ticking of clocks, as we've heard before, we can optimistically extrapolate this and say that we will detect it in this century. Right? So that gives me hope. Now to my own technology, the light pulse atom interferometer. That's something that has been invented by three Scientists roughly at the same time, Jürgen Blüneck, Fritz Riele, and Steve Chu and Mark Kasevich, okay, four people. Um, this is a diagram showing the position of an atom as function of time. So the atom is on its way up in a vacuum chamber, has been prepared by a magneto-optical trap and various state selection stages, and is now moving upwards. And at a time t naught, we apply a laser pulse. The laser pulse interacts with the atom. In general, it can bring the atom into a different internal state, and it can kick the atom. It transfers the momentum h bar k of one photon. So the atom now moves upwards at a slightly higher velocity. 
with more laser pulses. So that creates the atom that brings the atom into a superposition of two states which separate vertically. More laser pulses recombine these two paths and interference happens. When the interference happens, the probability to detect the atom, I'm sorry, is given by the cosine of the phase difference. This is actual data taken by Ken Yao Chang at Stanford, has for many years been the most precise atomic gravimeter, only recently surpassed by a group in China. Why is it so hard to make progress here? Because it's all limited by vibrations. This measures gravity at a resolution of 11 nano G in one second. Each data point here is a single fountain launch. The phase difference can be calculated using standard methods, and I'm going to point out only this last term. This is the photon wave number, which tells you how hard the photons kick the atom. This is the acceleration, could be gravity, could be from forces pulling on the atoms. And this is the pulse separation time squared. So far, so good. What does that have to do with dark matter? We'll get to that in a second. For now, let's see. This was the basic atom interferometer, light pulse atom interferometer. There are also versions with material gratings. This technology has obviously been improved. So I'll point out two or three. One important thing is large momentum transfer. If I can kick the atom not with one photon, but with 20 photons, then the splitting between the interferometer arms goes up 20 times. And the kinetic energy of the atom as it moves goes up 400 times. So depending on where my signal is from, could be kinetic energy, could be gravity, I get a 20 or 400 fold improvement of the signal. This is actual data showing kicking the atoms with 18 photons rather than two. And you don't need to be a chi-squared expert to see how much the resolution has gone up. The method is called multi-photon Bragg diffraction and dates back to 2008. With very high precision comes very high sensitivity to vibrations to the point where you can no longer see the fringes, but they get all messed up thanks to vibrational noise. You can still correlate the outputs of two interferometers and you get a parametric plot plotting something like sine against cosine. So that creates an ellipse whose shape is given by the phase difference. And if you're lucky, the phase difference is what you want to measure. The vibration determines which point on the ellipse you get. Okay. But if you're not interested in that signal, then you can simply fit the ellipse and get a vibration-free estimate for your differential signal. So these are methods that have first been used in the context of gravity gradiometry and in the context of fine structure constant measurements by us in 2009. And this is a neat illustration of how the Earth rotates. Um, when you apply the laser pulse at a time t naught, the laser is pointing this way and the atoms fly apart this way, 100 milliseconds later, the laser beam has rotated with the Earth, so the wave packets are going to miss each other, and the contrast is going to go down. So that has been verified, and we installed a rotating mirror so that the contrast peaks here when the rotation rate of the mirror makes up for the rotation rate of the Earth. So we have seen ourselves that the Earth is rotating, this is probably the most important result in this um, talk. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's no longer new. <laughs> OK, to the fine structure constant. So why is it exciting to measure the fine structure constant? Well, this number is really found everywhere in physics. And as a result, you can measure it using methods from all fields of physics. For example, myonium spectroscopy or the quantum Hall effect measurements with neutron interferometry. But the most precise measurements come either from measurement of H over M, the ratio of the Planck constant to the mass of an atom, and I will describe in a second how that works, or from measuring the electron's gyromagnetic anomaly. So the electron is a little magnet. The magnet is about two times as strong as you expect in classical physics. That's the so-called g-factor. It's two in the Dirac theory, but it's slightly larger than two according to quantum electrodynamics. 
And the difference between the G factor and two has been measured in Washington and now in Harvard to a precision accuracy actually of 0.24 parts per billion. Why am I so picky with accuracy and precision? Accuracy is the real thing. If I'm playing dart and I'm always hitting the center, then I'm an accurate dart player. If I'm only a precise um, dart player, I will always hit the same spot, but it's not the correct one, okay? And if I'm neither precise nor accurate, then I'm shooting all, all over the place, right? So accuracy is the gold standard in precision measurement. That means there's a claim that G is really this number, and it's not just that I can measure small changes, it's that my claim is I've measured the right number. As I've learned the hard way, this is infinitely harder to achieve because if all you need is um, precision, then you don't worry about random offsets in the data, okay? Anyway, so G minus two can deliver the fine structure constant because you can use the standard model to calculate G knowing alpha or vice versa. And I shouldn't really be talking too much about this because the expert is here in the audience. How do I get the fine structure constant from H over M? And the answer is here. That's an equation that I actually can actually teach the undergraduates if I write it in this way. That's the energy of an electron in the Bohr model, the Rydberg constant times H bar C. The high energy people may remember it in this way. It's also MEC squared times alpha squared, and that's an equation that I can solve for alpha, okay? Once I solve it for alpha, I find alpha is a function of the Rydberg constant. I need to know the speed of light, but that's a defined quantity, and I need to know the ratio H bar over M electron. So that's given schematically here. My atom interferometer doesn't work with electrons, it works with atoms, but fortunately the ratio of electron to atom masses is now known to better than 0.1 part per billion thanks to the efforts of Klaus Blaum in Heidelberg. Okay, the Rydberg constant is known, it's the most accurately known fundamental constant um, by some definition, known to 11, um, digits of precision thanks to mostly Ted Hench's effort. And so what remains to be measured is H over M. Once I know these, I can calculate alpha and then I can insert that, or Kinoshita can, in an extremely complex calculation using many parts of the standard model, not just quantum electrodynamics, involving more than 10,000 Feynman diagrams. This is a tremendous effort and I get G minus two. Why am I spending so much time on this? It's because a lot of things have to be correct with the standard model if this comparison checks out. That's the first fact. The second fact is this seems to be a very unique situation in physics where one measurement that can be done with high precision, accuracy, sorry, is connected to another measurement that is extremely accurate through theory that is equally accurate. So it's not just that the input data is known, but the theory is inaccurate or the input data isn't known, only the output is known. Here, everything seems to work out. Do you have a question? <laughs> so uh, what is the current, uh, I mean, how many significant figures do you, I mean, the current value of alpha? So the best measurement comes from here and the combined error experiment plus theory is 0.24 parts per billion. I'm not sure what the leading influence is. Jerry, do you know? Uh, right, well, no. um, right now it's the, the, the leading error comes from the experiment because the theory has been improved. I should mention that this plot is outdated. Here the fifth order or the tenth order is only given as a estimate for its size, but it has been worked out so far. The point I'm making is the value of G minus two is shifted because they are muons and hadrons. It is slightly shifted because they are tauons. So you have to know a lot more than quantum electrodynamics to just get that number right. And if there was a new particle from, for example, dark matter, it might shift the value of G minus two relative to what's expected from the calculation. 
This doesn't require a fundamental symmetry violation, I should point out. So it's a very broad net that you cast in order to catch new particles. Where does the atom interferometer come in? This is a slightly different interferometer geometry. It's called the ramsey bode interferometer. And it measures mostly the kinetic energy of the particle, which is p squared over 2m. And p is given by the photon momentum h bar k. And so we end up measuring h bar k squared over 2m. And h over m is what we need to know in order to get alpha to higher precision. The goal is to match the accuracy of the g minus 2 measurement so that the comparison of theory and experiment can exploit the full accuracy of that measurement. The ultimate goal is to go even further because Elisa Nowitzki told me this morning that they are working on an improved measurement. Okay, so maybe we'll be much better in a few years from now. The way to go is to increase the momentum of those atoms because that increases the kinetic energy and therefore the signal. So we added a coherent matter wave accelerator in the middle called Bloch oscillations that increases the total phase and also increases the ratio of the total phase to systematic phases. This is very important. We have 310 photons between the fastest and the slowest arm in here. I think that's a record, and that gives 6 million radians of measured matter wave phase difference. We have adopted an idea that Markesevich has pioneered, namely compensating an AC Stark shift, which increases the contrast of the ellipses, as you can see here. And this is how the contrast changes with different pulse separation times. So that's slightly technical. I'm going to skip that. Systematics. This is some measurement of the fine structure constant. And I should point out that I haven't specified the absolute scale here. This is just a relative measurement because I don't want to be on record quoting a number before everything is wrapped up, right? This is 100 parts per billion from here to here. And this is the time that the atoms fly. And obviously, it should be a flat line, but it isn't. The linear trend we understand. The linear trend is a parasitic phase shift. But you see, it's not exactly linear. And so we implemented a spatial selection technique that makes sure we use only the atoms at the center of the beam. This has improved the agreement between theory and experiment to near perfection, or so we thought. But when you zoom in, you, will, you can actually see that this point seems to be slightly too high. So let's take this data at higher resolution. This is now one part per billion. This is the variation, all the known effects subtracted as of July 16. And this is the variation as of now. What has happened in between, we have learned that there's a particular quirk of laser beams. They are not exactly Gaussian in a way that we didn't expect. We expected the problem to be in the middle where the intensity is highest, but it actually comes from the tails. So improving that Gaussianness gets rid of that systematic. We've run Monte Carlos with this systematic. The Monte Carlos assume that we have no idea what the anomaly is. So we don't even know that it has this structure. Um, but it has this magnitude. And what error bar do we get from that? It's about 0.1 part per billion, a little better than that. Where does dark matter come in? Well, there is a known discrepancy between the muons g minus 2 and theoretical prediction. I wouldn't call it proof of a finding because it's between 3 and 4 sigma but it has been pretty persistent. If this is a real discrepancy and not a statistical artifact or an experimental systematic, then it could be a hint for a dark matter candidate that shifts the value of the muon g minus 2 around. And I want to be a little specific about that. Let's consider one particular candidate, the so-called dark photon. This is a plot of the log of the dark photon mass. So here the dark photon weighs 1 MeV. Here it weighs 1 GeV. And this is the so-called mixing angle. That's essentially if I have a process that 
generates one photon, and the mixing angle is 10 to minus 8, then it generates 10 to minus 8 dark photons also. So if you want, this is how strong the dark photon couples. The muon discrepancy that I just mentioned would be explained if the dark photon would lie anywhere in this green layer at one sigma. Okay? The current comparison, G minus 2 versus alpha theory and experiment, rules out this region, the blue triangle on the upper left corner. The beryllium 17.7 .7 MeV anomaly that was mentioned this morning would lie here. It's just not ruled out by G minus 2 versus alpha, but it would be ruled out for G minus 2 versus alpha comparison at 0.2 parts per billion. The complicated lines here are particle accelerator experiments ruling out dark photons. So essentially this upper area is ruled out and this lower left corner is ruled out. And here's astrophysics from the 1987 supernova. So a lot of this parameter space has been covered, but it seems that an interesting chunk here in the middle has not been covered. And I should also say that all the particle accelerator um, limits don't detect the dark photon itself, but instead decay products. So you need to make some assumptions about branching ratios and so on. Whereas the direct comparison relies on computing only one Feynman diagram and is a very solid theoretical prediction. So I would say these alpha versus G minus two limits are more model free than the particle accelerator ones. Okay, so that's the... This one? Yeah. That's labeled E141, and I think it's from CERN, and I would have to look up what it means exactly. I think they look. No, I think these are up here somewhere. I think this is looking at a beam dump, actually, what comes out of one of. Is, is there particle physics in the room? A particle physicist? Okay, <laughs> um, I would have to look up the reference. These are measurements assuming that there are certain branching ratios. So in some sense, it's not fair to plot them all in the same graph. I want to drive home that even if you compare the G minus two versus alpha directly, assuming that the branching ratios are fine and so on, you're still competitive. But if you want to be very accurate about it, then we shouldn't probably plot them in the same graph. I thought there was a German accelerator being built just to start exploring that region, so I'm surprised to see that. I see. So we should probably, or I should probably spend some time making sure that I understand all the details. It was a ton of work to put it all in a figure. I didn't have time to also read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> um, so under some assumption, these limits are valid and they are actual limits, but I can't give you the details what the assumptions are. Yeah, I'm sorry if this is only a partial answer. Anyway, so that's part of the motivation, but there's a broader picture here that any new particle, it doesn't need to violate a fundamental symmetry, such as in EDM experiments. I don't need to make any assumptions on its further behavior, except that it couples to electrons. From measuring alpha and G minus two, I get a limit on it. That's the broader piece of information. And apart from that, knowing alpha is a useful thing in and of itself. How am I doing on time? Five minutes, okay, then let's go very fast through dark energy. This is a project that we started five years back um, to realize a gravitational Aharonov-Bohm effect, and we're, this is still on our agenda, but then a year ago, my postdoc Paul Hamilton found a paper on the archive um, written by Claire Burridge at Copeland and at Heinz, pointing out that an atom interferometer of that construction could put limits on chameleon dark energy. This is one particular model of dark energy. But as we learned by now, 
there's a broader class of dark energy models that this is sensitive to. So let's see, what is dark energy? This is, of course, the data from the Supernova Cosmology Project and the High Seas the supernova search and this a graph I love because 20 years ago only this part of the graph was known and you see that the redshift versus luminosity plot lies exactly on the straight line that was predicted by a big bang universe that would slow down and perhaps even contract one day. And then people like Saul Perlmutter, Rich Miller and also the high Z supernova people measured one order of magnitude further and found that, of course, it deviates and that's the first solid evidence for the accelerated expansion of the universe. So this is a plot I love to show to my group because it means doing it one order of magnitude better can lead to a groundbreaking discovery, right? More data. At first, it seems hopeless to study dark energy in the lab because the dark energy density as given by the um, cosmological constant is one over the size of the universe squared. But if I express it in units of energy, then it's also seven hydrogen rest masses per cubic meter or an electric field of 14 volt per meter or one photon of 100 microns wavelength per cube of 100 microns to the third. So all these sound more human than this scale. And so maybe there's some hope. But what about models? The most straightforward model would be vacuum fluctuations, but already Wolfgang Pauli has realized that they would blow up. He had them wrong by a factor of two because he didn't know that the ground state energy of the harmonic oscillator was one half h bar omega. Since then, we have done better by a factor of two, but we're still 123 orders of magnitude off. If you're optimistic, you can say that all the cutoff scale to the four and even the quadratic terms cancel as they do in supersymmetry, but you're still stuck with this um, divergence and we have 33 orders of magnitude off. So I'm not a particle physicist. Um, I can't say what the solution will be. I can just point out that there's a problem and it's very likely that solving this problem will require new physics. That typically leads to new bosons. And if they are to solve the problem, then my naive experimentalist understanding is that they have to somehow couple to normal matter because otherwise, how could they do anything about this? Okay, I'm gonna throw this out there and I might be wrong, you have been warned. Um, if there is such a coupling, there are arguments that gravity should be the weakest force, so we should look around gravitational strength, but those arguments aren't rigorous, so maybe we should look in a range of factor of 1,000 above and below, right? And must be compatible with all existing experiments, of course, because such an additional force has never been found. Here are the famous limits by the Atwash group, and also this graph is outdated, so these exclusion plots of fifth forces versus distance scale rule out gravitational forces down to about 10 to the minus four meter scale. So is this all ruled out? Well, not so fast because the dark energy matter coupling could be screened. If you have a theory of a particle with a potential like this, what do I mean by potential? Usually in a Lagrangian there is a term that goes like the mass of the particle, mass times phi squared. So then this would look like a parabola. There's a pebbles retra model of um, quintessence, as it has been termed by Paul Steinhardt, where this potential has been replaced by this one. And people realize that this curvature here, which determines the mass, is variable. It is low in a low density environment, such as empty space, and high in the lab where the matter density is high. So this particle changes mass and highly massive particles mediate short range forces. And this is why this may be hard to detect and not ruled out yet. And they dubbed this the chameleon model because the particle behaves in a way to make it harder to detect, right? This sounds like a conspiracy theory. Um, in a sense it is, but the experimental question still is, can we rule this out. Now I want to make an analogy 
Maxwell's equations were not discovered until 1865, I think, was the final version published. But 30 years before, people like Faraday knew parts of them. This is Faraday's law of induction. It's this one, right? Ampere's law is this one, and Maxwell had to add this term. What I mean here, before there was a comprehensive and self-consistent theory of electromagnetism, there were partial theories which were not comprehensive and not self-consistent, but they were instrumental in making progress nonetheless. It took 60 years from initial experiment to a complete theory to the experimental verification. And maybe we're here in our study of the dark sector, which means we need to find Faraday's law of the dark sector, a not necessarily consistent and certainly not comprehensive theory, but one that is falsifiable, as this one was. So where's the those models are falsifiable, as I'll um, explain. So the idea of the screened force is that it couples only to the outermost layer of objects. Gravitational force between these two objects is very small. A force of gravitational strength that couples only to the skin of the cell phone and the ruler is even smaller and might not be detectable. Right? That's the idea. So how can I detect it anyway? So these three people had the idea. Replace one of the objects with an atom and the outermost layer of the atom is the entire atom, so I'm rid of one of the suppression factors, and I can now go ahead and rule this out. We built a cavity-aided interferometer to get high sensitivity and small spatial um, volumes. This is how it looks like. There's a sphere here that serves as the test mass. There's an atom cloud on top of it that's supposed to be attracted by gravity, and new bosonic forces, right? Here's the data. We pull the sphere in and out to eliminate Earth's gravity, which is by far the largest signal, and you see there's no real difference between sphere close by and not. And so any dark energy-induced extra accelerations are constrained to about a micron per second square. This is not all that impressive in the context of atom interferometry, but it rules out a great deal of previously unconstrained space. Why do I say these theories are falsifiable? Because this matter coupling parameter has a finite space to live. It cannot be lower than this because then it's in conflict with torsion pendula. It cannot be higher than this because then it's in conflict with us. If all this region is covered, then this theory has been falsified. So this is one attempt at a Faraday's law. Not necessarily consistent, but falsifiable. This is another comparison to the CERN and the Fermilab people, and um, I need to wrap up. I want to put it in context of collider limits, which are here, and the Edwash group is here, and show you a little bit how we, so we have everything worth doing is worth doing twice, so now we do it as well as possible colder atoms, vibration isolation, and so on. New data, this is the new data, that's the old data. Here is an analysis. We can now see the gravity between the proof mass and the atoms. And as I said, gravity is the key sensitivity that we need to reach here. So that will close that gap. Finally, how to move further to better alpha measurements we need to make the laser beam as precise as possible. We always assume it's a plane wave so that k is omega over c, but real laser beams are not. If we have a more powerful laser, we can make the beam very thick and make k precisely omega l over c to sub part per billion precision. That would be important for that. There's a whole world of a difference between just measuring accurate, between measuring precisely and accurately. If all we needed to do was measuring precisely, this project could have been wrapped up five years ago, right? General dark energy models. So we already looked at chameleons. Symmetrons can be ruled out by experiments like ours, so we're now writing a paper on that. And so-called Galileons can be ruled out in various ways. I'm going to click through that, whatever. And this is the summary. Measuring 
alpha and comparing with g minus 2 gives limits on exotic physics, and it also results in knowing alpha. And measuring tiny forces looks for bosons that could explain dark energy, not necessarily theories of dark energy, but maybe Faraday's laws of dark energy, attempts at first steps of a theory. With that, I would like to thank my collaborators, Paul Hamilton is now deservedly assistant professor at UCLA. Justin Curry is a very nice guy who helped us with the theory. I want to acknowledge the Packard Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the National Aeronautics Space Agency, and DARPA. Thank you very much. Oh, and the pub. <laughs> All right. Well, here's an error budget as I think now, and I think we've met maybe five months ago somewhere. This line in the error budget is new. It's this beam quality thing. And as I've shown you now, so what has held us back was always that the data varied with pulse separation time as it shouldn't. Now for the first time, this has been substantially suppressed. So in science, you always need to be optimistic and that's what I am and that's probably why I very often said that now we are really close and I'm saying it again now, you need this optimism, otherwise you wouldn't be a scientist. But you also need to be extremely careful before publishing a fundamental constant that somebody else is going to measure soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's the double thing that is needed, I think. So we'll see, hopefully this year, but I've said it before, so don't trust me. Okay, so we should move on. Okay, thank you.